Some quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, hi, I'm Todd Farmer with AffiliateMarketingPlan.com. And uh, we do have Wi-Fi here in the sessions. As you know, the um, idea is Affiliate Summit. The password is case sensitive. It's AFSUMWEST2013. All right, follow hashtag ASW13 on Twitter and, of course, at Affiliate Summit to find out news, promos, networking. And exactly two months from yesterday, there's going to be a very first performance marketing summit in New York City on March 12th, and registration open is now at affiliatesummit.com. Did I just go the wrong way? I did. And also, uh, Affiliate Summit East is going to be held in Philadelphia this year. Registration is also open for that at affiliatesummit.com, and it's going to be August 18th <laughs> through 20th. And the social network for Affiliate Summit. I'm not sure if you've joined that yet. Please do consider doing it. It's at moreconference.com slash ASW13. You need to know this code I found out when I signed up for it. The code is 73D2D. So make sure you note that when you sign up. And also there's an app. So if you're trying to figure out where you're going today, tomorrow, and all that kind of stuff, whether you have an iPhone or an Android, go into the iTunes store or the uh, Play store for Google and download the Affiliate Summit app. And note, you have to look for Affiliate Summit, not ASW Affiliate Summit. And the scheduling tool, asw13.sched.org, if you want to uh, kind of organize all the different uh, sessions that you want to check out here over the next couple of days. And also, the wonderful share a sale uh, party, it's called Under the Stars. I don't know if you all have plans this evening, but it's always a great party. This year, they're having a masquerade-themed party. It's always a great networking opportunity, and ShareSale definitely knows how to uh, put on a good time. 9 o'clock to midnight at the Chateau rooftop, rooftop at the Paris Hotel. So as I mentioned before, this is the 22nd Affiliate Summit. How many of you are the first, our first time Affiliate Summit attendees? Wow. So quite a few. How many of you have been to 18 or more Affiliate Summits? Only two? Anyone else? Sean, Missy? Hey. All right, nice. No wonder you rec I recognize you. <laughs> so us old-timers have these little buttons that says 10 plus. I want mine corrected to say 15 plus. Thank you. Yeah, so plus. this year, um, there's a record number of attendees, uh, 52.75. So thanks, everybody, for coming here right. and learning about affiliate marketing. And we look forward to learning today from our esteemed panelists here. Uh, but first of all, we've seen people in the past who have tried to sneak into sessions and to the conference. But this year should be a little more complicated because we have pink badges. It's not <laughs> good. What's so funny? Now we know who's the culprit. Why we have to do this. I'm kidding. Um, but if you do happen to run into somebody who's trying to sneak in, you can possibly win a VIP pass to the next Flight Summit conference if you let us know at to F some. Well, there you go. All right, so here we are. We're going to go and learn from the guys uh, who have been there and done that. And Amanda Orson, I'm going to let you introduce everybody here in a second. And I'm going to get out of this and bring it up to you in Chrome, right? Is this right? We're good? All right, good. Thank you very much, and welcome to our panel. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming. This uh, particular panel are for veterans in uh, affiliate marketing that have now gone on to build big branded companies for themselves. Uh, I think we have a network, a tool, a traffic source, and a tool. merchant. <laughs> well, <laughs> affiliate marketing tool. <laughs> so I was just going to ask, can you please uh, give your name, just go down the row, your title, what your company name is, and what it is you do. My name is Jason Akatif. I run Ads for Doe, which uh, we've now rebranded to A4D. Uh, it's a CPA network. We have about 1,200 offers and work with probably 400 direct 
uh, merchants and do a lot, focus mostly on media buying? I'm Michael Kojin. Uh, I run What Runs Where, which is a competitive intelligence tool for mobile and display ads. I'm Cyrus Laraspour. I run Lean Market. We're an ad platform for buying ad inventory that's sold in an auction format called real time bidding. My name is uh, Brandon Adcock. I am a co founder of a company called Direct Digital, which is a little bit of a misnomer now, but we are a vitamin and supplement company that uses a hybrid of direct to consumer and retail distribution. Thank you guys very much. Um, just to start, how is it? that you came into internet marketing, about how long ago was that, and uh, how long were you an affiliate marketer before you became, before you actually grew the companies that you have now? You want me to start? Mm -hmm. uh, I bought a biz op, if everybody knows what that is, a business opportunity. Uh, somebody sold me that I was gonna make money on the internet, and I bought it and read it and went from there. Uh, that was about eight years ago now. Um, I was a full-time affiliate for four and a half years, uh, started in the shadier side of things and then moved over into media buying and then got into the network game uh, about four, four and a half years ago now. I uh, started mailing when I was about 15 years old, which was about nine years ago, and I was an affiliate for, say, six or seven years. Uh, that also included... Uh, affiliate marketing through SEO and pay-per-click in the later years. I started in 2006 during the glory days of ringtones, if anyone remembers that. <laughs> um, I got started in internet marketing uh, when I was in college and I sat in on a presentation about SEO and that grew from there. I got involved in a startup that we exited while I was in college and then I uh, became an in-house manager for Lowe's Home Improvement. Uh, and then I was a full-time affiliate for about a year before I, I kind of got out of that to start Direct Digital. So did you guys always know that you were going to be an entrepreneur? Did you have other career intentions? Were you always, I know that this is a, an overused phrase, but were you always a hustler or did it just kind of happen? My uh, father, my mother, my grandfather all owned businesses and I remember going into the office and they got to go in whenever they wanted and they got to do whatever they wanted and everybody else had to work and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've always been a hustler, definitely. <laughs> uh, for me, I don't think it was ever an explicit long-term plan. It's just something that I, I've always done and never stopped. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of the same way. I remember when I was in school, I had the first CDR at my school, and this was sort of like during the age of Napster, and people would pay me $5 for making them CDs, and I guess that was sort of the start of my business experience. Um, I went through school sort of as a, as a straight shooter for computer science, but I don't think I ever had the expectation of being a full-time programmer. Um, my family, both my parents, have worked at one company their entire life. Uh, my mom's a retired teacher now, but my dad's been in his company for 35 years, and growing up, I just assumed I would kind of go through the same footsteps, that I would take a job, and then that would, that would be it for the rest of my life. And I'd kind of always done entrepreneurial things like Cyrus. I was the first one to get a CD burner. Uh, started out with that. And, you know, as a kid, you did stuff, but I never thought that I would be an entrepreneur, but I think it kind of grew as an extension out of what I learned and the natural progression for me to want to learn more and take on more responsibilities. I'm certainly glad my career has led me to that path, but definitely in the beginning did not think that would be it for me. So reminding everybody what it is that your company does now, how did you grow from being an affiliate marketer into the business that you have now? Was it sort of a natu uh, natural progression or was there you know, some external force, a third party that told you this is a good idea? So for me, uh, I had what I called project partners. I had about seven project partners, and what that meant was somebody that I was in a partnership with, and we were working on a project together. So what happened to me is I uh, had these seven project partners, and they became too difficult to manage through all the different affiliate networks and all the different stuff like that. So I actually got the network platform just to aggregate our own stuff. Um, at the time, I, I have a very good brand on Wicked Fire, which is a forum that we all know each other from. 
And on Wicked Fire, everybody found out that I had a network, and then I wound up with like 2,000 people signing up in the next three months, and I, I was owning an affiliate network, which honestly I never even wanted to do. <laughs> uh, for me, What Runs Where actually started as a tool that I was, I needed to use internally. Uh, I couldn't find any product out there that did what I wanted, so I built it. And, uh, as it, start, as it started to grow and the amount of information we were dealing with started to grow, it ended up taking up more and more of my time to add the features that I wanted and to kind of keep all the gears turning to the point where it was getting harder to run traffic. Uh, and at that same time, there were people that I had talked to about what I was doing, and they seemed really interested in it and kept offering to pay me for, or pay me for access to it. So eventually I said yes, and then later got a business partner, and it just kind of kept growing and growing into what into what what runs where is today uh, for me it wasn't the most natural progression from the affiliate side it was more just based on my location I live in Silicon Valley and I've been working as an affiliate for I think four or five years at the time that I started lean market and all the people around me were, were doing tech startups and and they talked about building software and I just kind of said like hey I'm doing this traffic thing and I'm sending clicks from point A to point B and no one really seemed that excited by that at the time. So I said like, well, well what if I build sort of the technology side of it? Would, would that be impressive? And I got involved um, <laughs> speaking with some developers and that was kind of the beginning of Lean Market. Um, I, I know for me, it definitely was the natural progression. I think it was a combination of industry things that were going on and, and just personal need to, to grow. And I got, as an affiliate, I was, I was active in the nutrition side and I think it's, everyone knows, you know, 2008, 2009, a lot of the nutritional offers that were available to be promoted were, you know, not necessarily on the up and up. And I was frustrated with the quality of the product, the quality of the back end service, the the end to end consumer experience, which is what led me to get into kind of my my own side to to want to provide a better product with real science behind it, uh, leverage retail distribution that no one else was doing at the time. It was unheard of for really a direct-to-consumer supplement to really be a combo on the, the retail side. And, and just wanting to, I got tired of being a one-man team. It, you know, really I wasn't used to that. I was work, used to working in team environments. I'm not a good coder and all that kind of stuff. So it lended itself to me to want to start a larger company to have a, a little bit larger of an ecosystem to work with. So to this point, how have you been able to leverage your affiliate marketing experience into the businesses that you've currently, that you've built and that you currently run? I think as an affiliate marketer, depending on what road you go down, um, because I went down the media buying road, uh, it, it's been tremendous for me. I mean, to be able to market, that, I always tell everybody, affiliate marketing is amazing because you can learn direct response marketing and you don't have to have a product, you don't have to fulfill, you don't have to do customer service, you don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is send somebody to an offer and see if they'll convert on that offer and then really focus and learn marketing, persuasion, all that kind of stuff. And then once you're ready, much like, like Brandon mentioned on the end, it's like learn it on with somebody else handling all that back end and then go and uh, start the company you know, now that you know you can sell the product already, I see so many people setting up products and you're like, Th that's never going to work. Like, you can't sell that. So for me, it, it's tremendous. And I think for anybody that, especially if you're going to get on the media buying side or PPC or whatever you want to call it, um, <clears throat> it, it'll teach you, teach you how to market. And that's, you know, you can use that in everything. I mean, uh, for me, the, the experience I had from affiliate marketing really was everything. It's what gave me the knowledge that let me create the tool, just how to identify you know, which traffic source an ad is running through, the, the different terminology, uh, really what, what would provide value to other people that were you know, looking to try and get information for their own campaigns they were going to start. But even more than that, it was really the people that I had known through affiliate marketing that made up our earlier customer base that let us get off the ground and let us do so without loans or venture capital or anything like that. Um, yeah, it really was everything for us. Yeah, I have to agree on users. That was a big part of it. It's, it's really nice to start a business where you can take all the connections that you've had in, in the job you've had for the last five years and, and transition that into a customer base. 
Um, for me, I think the biggest takeaway from affiliate marketing is, is a mindset. I, mean, I think of affiliate marketing as as a big optimization problem. Every day it's how do I improve CTR, how do I improve conversion rate, how do I lower costs. I think if you learn that in the nitty gritty of affiliate marketing, you can take that mindset to any business and improve it. Yeah, I would completely agree. You know, I think am I using some of the direct skills that I acquired when I was an affiliate? Not really, my roles changed a lot, but you know, I, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to do what I am doing now had it not been for, you know, a good run in affiliate marketing because it's not often that you can start with very little capital and spend ultimately, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in advertising as an individual and then you can leverage that optimization capability to when you launch your own products. I knew what to do in the beginning. I already had contacts with networks, so that kind of stuff was extremely valuable you know, I knew how to bootstrap our company in the beginning, but I also had the capital as an affiliate to start. So just like them, I would uh, completely agree with that. And it was a great path for me to come down. And I'm lucky to have come through at a time that I did. One other thing, my uh, all my staff always tells me, everything I do, I run like a campaign. So like I hire somebody, I look at my ROI, my return, just like I'm running a campaign. You know, how, how many calls are you making? What effectiveness? And, and really all facets of the business uh, lend themselves to optimizing, as Cyrus said, optimizing a campaign. But it, you can apply that really to anything. It's the same mindset. How are your business challenges now in your current companies different, uh, better or worse, than they were as scaling an affiliate marketing <laughs> business? Uh, hugely different. Uh, when you're an affiliate, you're at home in your pajamas. At least for me, I was at home in my pajamas, you know, making ads. BS in with friends on IM. Now I have employees, and that's that's how it's different. You've got everybody's interests have to be aligned. You've got to motivate the troops. I mean, it's a uh, going going from being a one-person team. We just our company just went through a, a pivot basically where we were deeply deeply uh, into the health and diet space, um, and then got into some trouble and then we shut all that down so that was like 90 percent of our revenue so i i'd always pivoted as an affiliate where you know it's like a campaign dies and you go figure out some other thing some new traffic source but it's a lot different when you have you know eight to ten thousand a day in overhead i mean f for us i would have or for me i would have to say one of the main differences is that when you're an affiliate your responsibility is really getting that user through. It's getting them through, getting them to sign up, and then that's the end of it. And now that's, you know, that's just the beginning. It's almost the ne negligible part, if, if anything. You're, you're responsible for the experience that that person has through the whole time they're using it. You're, you're responsible for the state of the product itself. You're having to watch the competitors that are coming up and, dis and, you know, and sometimes disappearing. It's just a whole different level of intensity. And, I also, I, I have to disagree, or I mean, agree with everything that Jason said. Um, having employees <laughs> and <laughs> is just, a, it's a completely different thing. Like I was very well suited to the, the lone wolf style of working. Uh, it's, you know, what I did for most of my career. And now it's something where, you know, you can't, it's not even just saying, you know, do this. Uh, that doesn't work very well at all. They have, to, they have to want to do it. They have to be excited about doing it that's how you get the best work from them and that's just something that when I started was completely foreign to me and I've, I've been I've been learning it and it's it's great but it's a huge huge difference for me uh, I I love the team aspect I, I was kinda getting sick of working from home just as one dude I, I love going into an office and having ping pong and snacks and and real live people to see that was sort of a, a nice transition um, the difficult part for me was the transition from going on a maker schedule to a manager schedule. I think when you're an affiliate marketer, you work most efficiently by blocking off half days or entire days where you can just sit down at your computer and you can grind for four, six, or eight hours or something like 16. that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really tough having people constantly interrupt you when you have like lots of different things going on. It, it, kind of, it kind of ruins your whole rhythm. And I feel like people who are looking to get into affiliate marketing that might have had more traditional jobs before might have the reverse problem, where they're used to breaking up their days into hourly chunks and scheduling things. And it's difficult for them to sit down and work for you know, four, six, or 16 hours, or whatever Jason works. Um, but I think, I think learning to do that transition back and forth is, is probably the, a healthy thing to have. 
uh, definitely agree with everything everyone said. I think, you know, your challenge is as an affiliate or, um, you know, rel relative to your specific portion of the consumer chain. So my, my challenges were making sure servers were up, offers were up, things are working that I'm buying traffic, all of which, you know, we still have now, but ultimately I've delegated down the chain, which now my responsibility is making sure that person's doing it. But even further, the thing that gets difficult is how to motivate people like we were talking about, you know, their, prog their career progression. You have to worry about where are they gonna be in three years, five years, not only about yourself. And you know, that it takes time to get there. It's taken me time. I'm still not that great at it, but I'm getting better. Um, and then for us, you know, when someone's consuming an ingestible that you make, you know, quality, product liability, and all that is extremely important. So there's a whole lot more now that I have to worry about in terms of keeping samples for years, records, testing, all that kind of stuff to, to be compliant with laws that, you know, I didn't have to worry about before and I was only handling one aspect of the marketing. And, you know, those are certainly huge challenges uh, and that's what <laughs> keeps me up at night. Um, but yeah. Um, can you name a few consequences of your business growth or your successes that you didn't anticipate and how did you react to or overcome them? Mm. Why don't you start? I mean, for me, one of the, it's, well, since uh, What Runs Where started out as a personal project, it was essentially like in its really, really early days running on a computer that was sitting behind my couch. And as it became a, you know, a real product with real users and, you know, we added multiple countries and multiple servers, we're now putting on gigabytes and gigabytes of data every single day, uh, just huge quantities. And the, the scaling of that was something that I really didn't anticipate. It took me a while to realize that this wasn't a project anymore. This was a company and it was going to be growing quickly. We kind of almost stealthily transitioned into what I think now is referred to as a big data company where nothing happens in minutes anymore. Any manipulation you have to do takes you know, hours or can take days. And uh, that was something that I didn't really anticipate early on. Uh, we've really jumped on that ball over the past year and really taken control of it. But uh, yeah, that was something that I didn't really anticipate in the early days. I would say compliance. Like when I was an affiliate, you know, I didn't even know what compliance was. I didn't know what the FTC was. I didn't know what the attorney general was. I was just buying ads for whatever, and a friend told me, hey, buy an ad, that's, just do this. This is making all this money. And I, you didn't really think about whether it was right or wrong or whatever, it just made money. And they sent you checks. And in, in going to running a network, um, in going to running a network, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with me, but we just settled a lawsuit with the uh, Federal Trade Commission a little while ago and we weren't running any of the creatives we were strictly a pass-through uh, in the process but I, I've had to get so deep into compliance and under I, I literally spend two to three hours of my day understanding what's compliant and we're in so many different markets from mortgage to insurance and and there's different compliance rules for nutrition mortgage insurance all this kind of stuff so you have typical advertising compliance and then you have the actual technical compliance and you know we have to have a general understanding of how that works because we have to be aware of what our affiliates are running and you know for me I, when I when I pictured myself as an affiliate or running a network you know it was like oh I'm doing business well no you, what you do is you do a lot of compliance and making sure everybody's doing the right thing and not lying and saying the right stuff and yeah that sucks <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we pro I individually, and I can't speak for my two partners, but, you know, I, I probably faced three major obstacles, you know, when we started the business because of growth in the beginning, I wanted to do everything. I was used to working by myself. I felt, and I still feel to some extent I made the right decision, but that I needed to know every aspect of the business inside and out, whether it was support, everything else. And about six months in, I, you know, I didn't think I could handle it anymore because I was working 18 hour days. You know, I, I wasn't seeing friends or family and, you know, ultimately I had a good handle on the business and we got started off right and that's important because the first few months when you start a business are some of the most important ones to make sure you get off the ground correctly. But we should have hired sooner and I think that's something that's counterintuitive to the affiliate nature that took me a while to get to. But 
is extremely important to hire intelligent, qualified talent uh, and early. Uh, shouldn't have shouldn't have been cheap on it. Not that we underpaid any of our talent in the beginning, but but willing to spend the money immediately. I think we could have grown a lot faster. But that was due to our success and growth. You know, we should have done it sooner, and eventually we overcame it by doing that. Uh, inventory was another thing. You know, as an affiliate, you know, your network gives you a lead cap. I used to ignore it. Blatantly would blow <laughs> past lead caps without regard at all for the merchant. Hundreds and hundreds of extra leads. And I'm not saying that because it's like, well, you sold it. But a lot of people did that. And that's one of the issues in the industry at the time. So you run into inventory issues. There's real reasons for lead cap. And especially when you're using an affiliate, um, it's hard to pro project for that traffic. So me owning my own products now, I'm, we don't use affiliates. We only buy internally. So I, I know and can project that. But running into inventory issues, being able to staff customer support correctly, those were all issues we ran into due to the success. And it gave me a little bit of appreciation for, for the merchants that, you know, that I drove volume to and as did other people. Um, and then the other one is, is you know, I've come to appreciate uh, flying under the radar a little bit in the sense of not having to apply for recognition and things like that. You know, for the first time we recently were recognized locally for, for growth and it, it created a lot of unwanted attention from everyone that wants to sell you something. And it's something I think a lot of people, you know, in this day and age with sites like TechCrunch, everyone's raising rounds. There's this, uh, you know, idea that you have to put out all your accolades. And there's something to be said for focusing on your growth of your company and not having to deal with all the extra company. What they don't tell you is, you know, there's lawyers that sue everyone as soon as they announce their Series A round. So if you announce you raised 25 million, probably two weeks later, the same law firm that sues 100 people a year will sue you just because you announced you raised money. So there's a lot to be learned, and that's one of the things that we've learned over the last couple of years is, is, is the negative side of, of publicly touting growth. Yeah, I've never uh, sold a physical product the way Brandon's talking about, so I can't speak to inventory issues in, in terms of scaling, but I, I definitely agree in terms of the removal of distractions. For example, like the culture of fundraising. It's just another thing that as your business grows, you, you kind of want to look more and more popular and fabulous, and it's, it's difficult to get out of that mindset and focus on the real important things. Um, the same thing with people constantly trying to sell you stuff. Also, just a as you, for example, come to more affiliate summits, your network is going to grow and you're going to have more people that you can call on for help, but you're also going to have more people that can call on you for help. And it's, it's difficult as that, um, that chunk of time starts to take more and more hours out of your week to focus on what's important because you wouldn't have that big network if you didn't run a successful business. And, and sometimes the business does so well that all the auxiliary stuff starts to take up more time that it ultimately falters. One, one thing I wanted to touch on that uh, I've really had the experience of in the last six months, so I've been in this business for eight years plus now, and uh, I always, I didn't even recognize what operations was. Um, I, we tried to, I always tried to just manage and do everything ourself, myself or, you know, put it on the salespeople or put it on accounting or whatever. Like, it is really important. I, we, I now have a, a vice president of operations within the company, and it has been a life-changing difference. Like, I, I have a guy that sits there and deals with the BS, like all the little minutia things that need to be dealt with and systematized and all that, and it just was going undone. Like, it, you know, so if you're going to start a company, first person you hire, make them an operations person and, you know, let them build the business and then you really focus on whatever you're good at, the sales or, you know, putting deals together or what have you. So this question just kind of leads into the next one, but just a quick poll. When you were affiliates and just affiliates, did you hire or outsource at all? Uh -huh. I tried numerous times and, you know, my experience was uh, and, and maybe I just had bad experiences, but like I'd have somebody build me a page and it'd have a form on page one with a submit button and then they'd build page two and they'd send it back to me and I'd, I'd fill in the information and hit the submit button and it wouldn't work. And I'd go, well, why didn't, why doesn't it work? And he's like, oh, well, you didn't tell me when you hit the submit button, it was supposed to post that information and go to the second page. And, you know, this, uh, you know, just the language barrier a lot of times and also just the, I don't know, my experience was like people didn't uh, look, look forward. Now, on the other side, we use an outsourced uh, CFO accounting uh, team 
that is fantastic. I mean, they've come into our business and created all the reporting and all that kind of stuff, and I haven't had to pay a CFO, and that, that's been really, really good, but outsourcing internationally for like coding or anything, I've had terrible experiences. Um, I've, uh, I've pretty much tried to avoid outsourcing whenever possible. The only time I've ever done it is for just incredibly repetitive tasks that I honestly in good conscience couldn't have get anyone that I actually know <laughs> to do. Um, <laughs> that's, that's about the limit of outsourcing. I think that for most things I would either rather do it myself or have somebody that's sitting there in the room with me that I, you know, that I know well and where I understand their capabilities, I'd rather have yeah, either me or them do it. I think it's hard to hire somebody for a job if you're not at least somewhat competent at it already. So from the beginning, I, I was a generalist. I, I think good CEOs tend to start out as generalists and then mm -hmm. find something to be an expert in. So um, I think if you're looking at starting a business as, as a one-man shop, that's a real good way to learn everything that your company is going to do end to end. I would, I would completely agree with that. I think, you know, for me, when I was an affiliate, I, I can't design and I can't code. And it's probably why I failed for the first couple of months because no one wanted to buy things through the path that I was creating because I, I couldn't design or code and it was shoddy work. So once I started outsourcing that, things got a lot better. But, you know, my partners and I, when we started, one of the, our big philosophies was to outsource as little as possible and instead hire talent to do it in-house. Uh, you could get things done on deadlines you wanted, the quality of work is better. And so that was extremely important for us to, to make hires instead of outsourcing. So it's kind of, we don't really do that anymore except in the areas uh, that, you know, we really, obviously we outsource legal work, things like that, where you really need to have outside expertise, but we try not to do that now. So how's it different now to, from where you are with your companies to hire employees than it is to outsource? Sure. How has that process been different? So I think, so for us, you know, we find it sometimes, I don't know, hiring can be hit or miss. Sometimes it's really easy and you, you almost pinch yourself when you find a really good employee and then other times it's very arduous. Uh, you know, for us, probably our th two most critical hires were a director of finance and a VP of sales and the salesperson handles our retail side because I was managing that and it's obviously not what my background is in. I was an affiliate. So we've, we've done way better once I removed myself from that equation. But it took us a long time to find that person. And, and sometimes uh, hiring a, f to fill a body immediately is not always the best thing to do. And it takes a while. And you sift through good candidates. And sometimes you have to look at a really smart person that could be good, but they're just not a right fit for your company culture or something else. So I, I think that's been tough for us. We've shied away from using recruiters which we're probably going to have to start doing more and more. I hope there's none in the audience because I'm getting sick of calls from recruiters uh, for helping to hire. But, but, you know, they do serve a purpose and it helps fill some of the roles quickly. But hiring is tough. You know, when you've never been on that end before, how do you know how to really check someone out? How, are they going to be a good fit? Are they as good as they say they are? Sometimes, you know, at least for me, usually I have the last call. We can make a consensus, but I interview everybody. And you shoot from your gut, and that's kind of what I've been doing. And we haven't gotten burned too bad yet. Yeah, I think the first five or ten people you hire should be on par with the types of people you would found a company with. I don't, I don't, I think it's very difficult for like first early hires to, to have that much of a culture difference or to have that much of an expertise difference because if you're going to build a company with someone that you're spending, you know, 40 plus hours a week with sitting in an office, you, you need, to, they need to pass the would I have a beer with this person test and yeah. yeah it's a very accurate statement. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my company is all software developers, and in the Valley, those are really, really difficult to hire. So it's, it's pretty much been all from um, our existing employees' networks. Otherwise, we have a kind of hard time recruiting from Facebook and Google. Uh, hiring has actually uh, always been a bit of a challenge for me, uh, just because I've been doing this for so long that I haven't really worked a normal job. So because I haven't gone through the hiring process myself, it was a bit shooting from the hip for a while. Um, but if there's one thing that I, that I think has driven like really good success for uh, as far as hiring goes for us, it's been getting employees that have worked with people that I already know, uh, that have finished projects with them, or that has you know worked at their company for an extended period of time. That way, I really, you really know their capabilities, you really know that they're good people, and really you also know that they could work with someone that you already work with. So there's a, a good chance that there's going to be that level of, you know, of compatibility. And those first few hires really are so important because it, 
it really defines the culture that you're going to have moving forward. And once you start that, you can't really take it back very easily because you certainly don't want to fire like your first employee or your second employee because they've got a pretty good knowledge of what's going on and that's, you know, that's very valuable. But at the same time, if, you know, if your second guy is, you know, is slacking off, the first guy and the third guy and the fourth guy are going to be very aware of that and they're going to think that, that is the standard that you hold people to. So it's been, it's been challenging, but I, th I think we've, we've done very, very well. We've got a, we've got a great staff. When I first started hiring, I, uh, the, the network was on fire and I was just putting butts in seats and it, it became very difficult. Um, the account managers thought it was their business so everybody would look at the money coming through that they were managing as sales reps and be like, oh, I generated this and they don't recognize that there's brand and there's a whole business behind it and there's cash and float and carry and all that kind of stuff. but. I, uh, I'm terrible at hiring people. Um, one thing I have re recently learned though is uh, I, I never believed that I could hire somebody better than myself. Now this was a big thing for me. Um, I, I, always, I was always better than my employees at almost everything that they did. Al almost always. And then I hired this guy that is, a, he was the creative director for the Timberwolves. So like when you walk into the w Timberwolves, uh, arena or whatever, every single thing in there he designed. And he came in and he started teaching me about project management and started teaching me about, you know, good design work and brand and stuff like that. And it changed my life. So now I, I, my old strategy used to be um, hire just whoever and try and train them. But now I hire the very best people for the higher roles in the company. And then I let them hire the rest of the people because I, I'm not very good at it. So they say uh, more money, more problems. And obviously there's more money involved in your companies than there was as an affiliate. How did you guys come up to speed with who to hire uh, as an accountant or a lawyer or when that person should be hired? How did you learn that whole process? since it's not intuitive. When, when I started, I did all the books myself. I was the only affiliate manager. I was the biz dev. I was everything. And in about uh, four weeks, three weeks of being in business, I needed to hire uh, an affiliate manager. I, I hired a developer. I hired a bookkeeper. And I just, like I said, I just hired people. Um, my bookkeeper is still with me. I mean, she actually, even though she's a big pain in the butt, she. Yeah, uh, she's, she's good uh, at really caring about what's going on. Um, but like I was saying before, I use a bookkeeper and then we outsource to a firm called TGG to do all of our high level accounting stuff and that, that's been a godsend for us. So like all of my collections reports and cash flow summaries, which is huge in our business because we're paying out weekly most of the time and we're getting paid on anywhere from you know, monthly net 15, monthly net 30. So all that cash flow projections and uh, risk tolerances and all that kind of stuff, they've, they've helped us with. But, uh, you know, just go, go through and ask, you know, as, as everybody here had said, you know, one of the great parts of being an affiliate and like we all met on a forum, I have a huge network of, of individuals that I can talk to and ask questions and that's typically how I'm, I'm going about those things. Uh, when it comes to things like lawyers and accountants and all of that, uh, really, honestly, uh, most of our decisions for that are based on the people that we know, in, you know, in our in our local area that we respect. Like if I if I'm you know talking to a variety of people that have been having trouble with their accountants, like uh, just pay attention to who they say they ended with and why they ended with that person, and eventually you'll start hearing the same names over and over and over and that's a, a pretty good place to start it's not a it's not a perfect method but there is no perfect method uh, but that's the best we've come up with so far and I think it's working quite well I think the first step is to figure out which professional services need to be a core competency of your business like maybe if you have dozens of merchants paying into your network and you're paying out thousands of affiliates accounting is a really really important thing but for us accounting wasn't so it's just something that sort of stands in the way of getting the job done. Like when I think about what's important to our customers, I, I don't think they really care that we have a great accounting department. What they care about is stuff like our, our infrastructure. So for us, professional services related to like ops and data is, is much more important. And for that, um, I just had some investors and advisors that I think are really important for, for making key introductions. 
Uh, I think for me, when I was an affiliate, the whole goal is optimization, so you try to run as lean as possible. And that, you know, when I was an affiliate, I did my own books and then turned it over to my accountant. You know, legal fees, I tried to spend as little as possible. And, you know, it's a mindset that took me a while to get out of. But now we, I try to do the complete opposite because usually those are the areas that really come to bite you later. And it's better to pay more up front and get it done by the best that can be done rather than face issues because you have poor cash flow management. You know, the day we started the company, we built a model and we've expanded on it. We still use it today, but it does everything cash flow by the day to project out. And, you know, it's extremely important. So for, for us, you know, one of the first hires we made was a director of finance because if you need to have a good, accurate picture of your money and accounting wise, it's one thing to do your books, but it's another to actually do accounting, um, you know, especially when you're dealing with inventory, tax credits, uh, you switch to accrual books instead of cash. Because uh, once you get out of an individual world, and if you ever want to raise money or deal with any sort of major company, you have to be on accrual books. You just you have to, and so it changes the whole accounting landscape completely. So you know, for us, we hired Price Waterhouse to be our auditor. Uh, that was expensive. Sometimes I wonder if it's worth it, but in the end, you have to tell yourself that it will be because you may have challenges you run into because. Sorry, these lights are like flickering big time. Um, you know, and so I think that for us, it was important. Same thing with lawyers. It's one of, the, you know, I really hated writing checks to our attorneys, but, you know, I still hate writing checks to our attorneys, <laughs> but I write it in good conscience knowing that we use the best attorneys that are out there and ultimately they'll save you from unforeseen problems that you don't know. And it's really, really good to use good people. Um, and those are two areas that I didn't have an appreciation for before, but now, you know, it's, it's, if I had gave a piece of advice to myself back then, it was to immediately use good people and not try to skimp on those. So uh, actually tying in with that, if you were going to start all over again as an affiliate, like you're in the crowd right now as an affiliate, what would you do differently today knowing what you know? Um, for me, I would do everything sooner. I, nothing's ever fast enough for me, which, you know, I, I've come to try to slow down a little bit, but I wish I had become an affiliate faster. I see that I miss things, missed opportunities. I wish I had done what I'm doing now faster. Um, so those, uh, I would, I, it's, obviously you can't tell yourself to do things faster, but I would have uh, acted upon my instincts or ideas faster. You know, I, when I was, in 2008, I would tell myself, you have this idea, move on it. Don't sit on it. You know, have the confidence in yourself. The real difference that separates people that are successful from not is taking a risk. Ultimately, you will fail several times. Various things, whether it's big or small, you'll take a risk. You have to understand you may fail, but it's better to attempt it than to never attempt it because you'll always tell yourself, oh, I probably could have done it. Well, you don't know, or it may change your life. And so ultimately, I wish I had take, took my risks sooner. Uh, and that's probably the biggest piece of advice I would give myself. Yeah, I think getting over the analysis paralysis is only getting more difficult because the industry is getting bigger, so there's this wealth of knowledge. I mean, I yep. read affiliate marketing forums for at least six months before I started my first campaign, and I think if I was starting again today, it'd be years probably because I, I have this mentality where I feel like I want to know everything before I get started, and I think you just kind of need to get over that. Um, for me, a big part of it would be action, but it would also be um, the mindset of, of thinking about how I wanted to be involved in the affiliate marketing space. I, I think if I was to start again today, I would see affiliate marketing as a stepping stone to something bigger. Um, back when I started, I didn't think of it that way, but now even just coming to this convention, you see so many people here, but how many of them are just affiliates? There's, there's so many companies. So this is really an industry you can build a career out of and not something you need to do in, in a temporary way. And I think that's, that would have been something that I would have liked to know coming in. I feel like so far everyone's really uh, really hit it pretty well. Uh, I definitely would have come on faster and stronger. And uh, even in how, like, and how uh, What Runs Where ended up uh, coming into existence and developing, I think the same thing holds true. I, like, I wrote the original system that we were using. And in hindsight, after doing that, I should have been bringing on developers immediately. Because every single person that we've added to our company, every single time that we have expanded, it has greatly improved the product. It has greatly improved just the, the general operation of the, of the business. And coming out of the, the lone wolf affiliate mindset, uh, it, it, took, it took some time, and especially with a project that's you know, your brainchild, your baby. Um, you know, it, it stings a little bit 
when you when other people are taking a part of it, but expanding quickly, I think, is almost always worth it. I would say if I could do some go back and do something differently, it would be really be honest with yourself and if you're gonna build a business, recognize what you're good at and don't try and do the stuff you're not hire that person right away i am a terrible operations person if i were to do it again i would hire an operations person immediately why because that frees up all my time and what i'm really good at is building deals buying media making money like and that's what i enjoy doing i hate doing operations so you know i would hire somebody to come and, and the operations person will actually build your company for you if they're a good operations person you don't even have to build it they'll come in and build it for you you're like okay here's what we want to do this is where we want to go build me some systems and processes and then go do it and you can focus on what you're really good at that makes the that makes the company the core amount of money D don't mess around with minutia and and you know trying to save a buck here or save a buck there because in the end you're you're what do they say stepping over dollars to pick up pennies um and and i think that's a very true statement you know the is be real with yourself and let yourself and stand in your reality that says i suck at this i suck at this i suck at this i'm gonna hire these people and i'm gonna focus on what i'm really good at and that's what's gonna propel your company even faster Maybe add one more thing, and this is glaringly obvious. I don't know how I forgot about it. One of the biggest problems I had, and I would have told myself this quickly if I knew to change it, I was too worried when I was an affiliate, and I've tried to be better about this now, what everyone else was doing. And this is not to take away from what runs where because it's a very valuable tool and we use many tools like it, but you use them to the extent they can help your business but not be so concerned about what everyone else is doing. I took, I spent way too much time having to know what everyone was doing to put a benchmark for my own business and comparing myself against what they were doing, who was doing what here, how many traffic sources were they on, this is who's who. I spent way too much time and it, it, it drives very little value. There's a huge diminishing return on that. In the beginning, you learn what some people are doing, you get ideas out of it. You know, it's just natural way of business, but then at some point it provides no additional value. And, I, I, you know, we, we're much better about that today, but I would have done that much sooner as an affiliate. And my, once I stopped focusing on that, my affiliate business grew a, a lot faster. And, and not just the campaigns, right? right. It's, it's not just being concerned about seeing what creative people are running and if they have any good ideas for headlines. It's also um, being overly concerned about the individuals, right? Do you have friends that are, that are more successful than you? Are there people on affiliate marketing forums that are running bigger numbers than you? People get actually caught up in these sorts of things and, and making comparisons, and that's not really what's Someone important. Someone is always bigger. Yeah. Always. Someone is always going to do more than you, be better than you. You know, you should strive to be the best, but just accept the fact that you're not the biggest. And once you get over that, you will do a lot better. Actually, if, if I could chime in, I think uh, when, it, when it comes to that kind of, like you'd met, earlier you mentioned uh, information paralysis, and I think that's a very real thing. And I think that when you are, if, when you are looking at your competitors and when you are looking at what, uh, what other people are doing, there needs to be a purpose to it. You need to be trying to learn from their mistakes or you need to be like at a certain dead end that you're trying to get past. Because if you're just looking at information to look at information, like we've got a lot of it. <laughs> you can do that for a long time. What, what, when people are really getting value out of, you know, especially our service, they're coming in, they know what they're looking for, they know, you know, in, in some cases what they suck at and, that, and that's what they're trying to correct. And uh, we've actually had support phone calls with people where we actually end up having to push them in that direction because they'll sit there and they'll look at it all day and they'll try and pick apart things well past the point of usefulness. Uh, it's good. It, I think it is good to know what everyone else is do, what uh, what everyone else is doing and what the trends are. But there has to be a purpose. You have to know why you're looking at it, not just try. Yeah. <laughs> So what separates the people that actually make it, that like make the jump, that go beyond affiliate marketing, or especially we've seen a lot of maturation or maturation in the CPA space the last few years. What separates the people that actually build big companies? What separates you from the people that were your peers three and four and five years ago? I think that um, it just, you know, fear. More than anything, I would say. I mean, I think most people are just afraid. I mean, it's that first employee you gotta hire and you're like, okay, shoot, I'm making 150 grand a year. 
I'm going to pay this guy 40 grand. Holy crap, now I'm only making 110. But what you don't realize is you pay that person 40 grand and they make you 200. You know, but it's that first hurdle to step through. And I think a lot of people are just, they're afraid. I mean, I, I, I grew up, well, grew up, but, you know, have been on a long journey with a lot of affiliates. And I think there's, there's a group of affiliates out there that are like, they think it's cool to not be uh, corporate or not run a real business and I'm I'm just a hustler and I'm gonna slang whatever and you know I uh, what well, you know I, I specifically remove myself from those communities because I did want to build a real business and I uh, you know that's that's what I gotta say <laughs> I think fear definitely does play a big role in it and I think the but I think the other big thing is complacency uh, once things do take off, it's really, you know, there's a, there's a period of time where it's generally, if you're an affiliate, easy to let things kind of idle and you can make a lot of good money. And But some people don't ask themselves what's next, or if they do ask themselves, their answer is the beach. Where if you can make, you know, if you're doing $200,000, $250,000 a year, working, you know, just a few hours a day, that's great, double it. <laughs> See what you can do then. See what you can build. See if you can get something that's not going to be quite the, the roller coaster that affiliate is. Uh, like I said earlier, I've been doing, it, doing this for quite a long time. I've been rich and broke more times than I could count. <laughs> it is a roller coaster. But when things are good, I think making that transition is all about just that, that, that drive to, to expand and to create something a bit more sustainable. And it's really easy to walk away. It's really easy to just relax and you know, be happy with it and, you know, until it all falls apart in, six, you know, in a couple months. And then you gotta build it all back. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a complacency, I would say, is the thing I see a lot. Yeah, I think it's a personality trait. I don't, I don't think it's something that you can control. I, th I think if you have the insatiability and you're doing this and you're constantly hungry and whenever you hit X amount of revenue or Y milestone or whatever it is, you want something bigger, I think if you're that type of person, then you're going to eventually end up running a really big company. I, I would agree with all of that. I mean, I think I'm fortunate enough to meet a lot of really great people, very smart, intelligent people when I was in affiliate marketing, you know, two of which, you know, I just met Mike today, but two of which are sitting up here with me and they've done great things and you know I think a lot of it comes down to complacency wanting more uh, but there's nothing wrong with being an affiliate you can make a great living out of it you can find it rewarding it's just about what you want out of things in the future uh, mm -hmm. but I think the one this the separation is 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 affiliate marketing a job or a lifestyle If it's a lifestyle then it's probably a good fit for you and you'll be in it for a long time to come but I, I think that you know some of my friends that haven't made a jump to something else which it's fine they haven't uh, a lot of it's complacency and they've spent a lot of time traveling around and doing other things and not focusing on business and that's a choice they've made and several have been happy with it but it's, it's, it wasn't for me at the time. So talk a little bit more about networking. Obviously networking was, has been integral to growing your businesses to this point. How did you initially build that network? Uh, what were, I mean, we're at Affiliate Summit West so how was Affiliate Summit West instrumental to building that network? What forums or other things did you use to build that network initially? Uh, networking is my whole business. Uh, I'm a CPA network, so uh, affiliates and merchants on both sides of that coin are what we do. So without networking, I'd have nothing. Um, uh, we all met on a forum, as I mentioned before, called Wicked Fire. Uh, monumental, very instrumental in, in everything I've done and all my success. Um, you know, I, I really thank uh, John Fisher is the one who founded that and not so much for his great advice and stuff like that, but providing a, a uh, place where, uh, you know, providing a place for where we could all communicate. I mean, I met everybody up here on this panel. I probably met 500 people through Wicked Fire over time. Um, also, I remember the first affiliate summit I came to, whatever, seven years ago, it was here, there was one aisle of booths. I, I flew up on a whim, a friend of mine gave me a badge to use. I went in and I was like, 
wow. I, because, you know, as an affiliate, you're just at home by yourself. I bought a biz op. I didn't even know if it was real, if any of this stuff was all just like a scam. And, you know, I was just falling for it. And I remember I showed up to Affiliate Summit and I was like, this is a real business. Like, I could do this. <laughs> and I was so excited. And I went home and I, I you know, before it was like, ah, I'd like to make a little money. And then I went home and I was like, this is it. This is where I'm. This is where I'm going to be. Online marketing, and you know, it's it's now evolved from just affiliate marketing for us to building products, um, internal media buying for agency type work, creative type work. I mean, we do tons and tons of stuff now, as well as building two, three other businesses outside of A for D um, that are all internet related. But it all it all stems back to Wicked Fire and uh, and Affiliate Summit for me. Um, for me, I've actually done the same thing in uh, three different communities. I did it in the mailing community in my younger days, uh, SEO later, and later in the pay-per-click in media buy space. Uh, it is definitely very forum heavy, a uh, wicked fire among, you know, among others, depending on uh, which, uh, which particular skill it is. But just being out there and learning what you can and then being helpful to other people, I think that's really the biggest thing that's helped me grow and helped expand my network. People remember it, and you know that guy that was kind of annoying, hitting you up on Skype every ten minutes, you know, six <laughs> months ago. Like I've watched many of them turn into people that uh, that I learn things from, and that introduce me to people that I make a lot of money working with. And it also makes it so that when I do come to things like Affiliate Summit or Ad Tech or any trade show, I already have that base of people, and they have their, you know, they have people that they know that I don't, and I end up getting introduced to them. And it just feeds on itself, and it's just really about being out there and being as helpful as you can with the skills that you got. And that's really been everything for me, I think. One other thing I wanted to mention is uh, build a brand for yourself in the community if you're that kind of a person. I think that, uh, you know, I know at least for Mike and, and myself ha really uh, has helped probably both of us a lot. It, it lets people, I have a blog and he has a, he had, uh, do you still have your blog? Uh, I died. Oh, he did have a blog. <laughs> and, and it lets people kind of know who you are and what you're thinking and then you show up to a place and they go, oh, you're that guy, cool. You know, and it really helps you build your network. If, if you're somebody that, you know, wants to, wants to brand yourself, I think it's tremendously helpful. Yeah, I think we're all talking about how our networks have been helpful, but not really the way that people traditionally use the word networking. Like meeting people by helping them on Skype or running a blog or, or being a member of a community or forum or something like that I think is really good. But I, I think if you're expecting to come to an event like Affiliate Summit and you measure success by how many people you can make it rain business cards on, that's not really a great way to build a network. I think if you're I think if you're involved in meeting people and seeing how you can help them and just being a nice guy, you'll end up becoming this hub of connections that can be really valuable for your business. I mean, I, I think I can probably think of two instances in my life that have really changed, uh, changed my life for me for the better. One was quitting my job in-house to become an affiliate, and the other one was attending Affiliate Summit West in 2009, which before now, it's, it's the only one I've attended. Um, and I didn't go to any sessions, but I think some of them are very valuable. Um, <laughs> I met I met one of my business partners at, at Affiliate Summit West 2010, which he's changed my life, obviously, for the better, dramatically. Uh, almost all of my close friends in the industry now, I'm, I met at Affiliate Summit West in 2010. Uh, I think, you know, probably uh, two things really helped me with with that. You know, I've always tried to, tried to provide information as much as I got out of it. Generally, you'll find that if people just see you as an, a leech, they'll cut you off with information. So I've always tried to pay it forward and know that it will come back. Uh, hopefully, I think people would say that about me that I've, I've worked with. Um, and so I think that really helped me develop my networking, people that I've relied on over the years to learn things and grow. Uh, and then, then the other thing was not force it. Like, just like Cyrus said, I, I don't even bring business, I don't even have business cards today. I, I, I don't carry ever business cards, which is bad, but you know, <laughs> uh, so you should carry them. But you know, not just forcing them on people, meeting someone, connecting on a personal level with them. And those are the relationships that ultimately are gonna pay off later. I mean, I, I can't even count 
and the number of friends that I've met now that we still do business together, then in random conversations I figure something out, and it's only probably because we had open dialogue, we were willing to share, not closed off. Now, not to say you should run around spouting all your secrets to everybody, but you should find a you know group of people that are like-minded that you can become friends with and share stuff to, but ultimately networking has paid off huge dividends. Yeah, I don't think I've had a, a financial relationship with Brandon in, I don't know, years now, but he's still able to introduce me to people that will be really good customers for our product. So it's just those sort of connections that are really valuable. Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll reiterate. I think it's very important to, when you're networking, to actually truly be interested, especially if it's an inner industry thing, really be interested in what the other person does, not what they can do for you, and you know, not push your product or push your whatever on them. Like really sit down and go, well, what do you do? How'd you get involved with that? You know, what about this? What about this? And really dig and understand their business and then say, oh, you know what? I think we could do something together here or we could do something together here. But if you really sit and listen there, you know, you'll build those networking connections really, really strong. I mean, when I was on Wicked Fire, it, it really was, uh, uh, I, I don't want to swear. So uh, <laughs> it was, you know, but people just flaming everybody and, you know, being a big hate show. And you know, I was always, I always made a point of posting very good content that you know answered people's real questions and you know built that brand for myself. And I think you know the, the same transfers to life and networking and, and who you meet. So we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask one last question. Uh, assuming that you're sitting in the audience here and you might be interested in building a massive company or making that jump from being an affiliate marketer to a network or to an affiliate tool or to a traffic source or to a merchant, what actionable advice would you give them? I mean, the biggest thing I would say is if, if you have an idea, do it. I mean, that's the biggest barrier to entry on everything is somebody not, act, not acting. Obviously, I'd rather you not be in supplements, but, you, you know, I think uh, on, on anything else, you know, inaction is the worst thing you can do. And that's the biggest piece of advice. And I, you know, regularly I get pitched business ideas, either investing or friends that want to do something, and very few of them ever do anything. And sometimes it's, you know, quit what you're doing. I, I paused extremely profitable campaigns when we started the business because I knew that if I didn't focus on what I was doing, I would spread my resources between things. Ultimately, the campaigns would have died off eventually, but you, you need to decide on something, make a leap, jump in at full, you know, uh, everything you have and do it instead of just kind of straddle things do it a little bit here and there some stuff on the side work on it a little bit that's 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 definitely what I would say yeah I think action is definitely the first step and, and I think the next probably would be to think in really really big scale um, mm -hmm. starting a business is already so difficult regardless of what you're doing any business it's gonna weigh on you so emotionally um, I think it makes sense to think of whatever business you're planning on starting and and think about a way that you can make it 10x bigger because it's not going to be 10x harder to make it 10x bigger. So you're going to get the best expected value by trying to start the biggest business that you can possibly think of. So we pass to you for right now. Come back. Set a set a very big goal and work backwards. That's what I do uh, in all businesses I start now. Like we have one, you know, I, I have one company that I'm building. And you know, I'm going for a three to five hundred million dollar valuation uh, is what our goal is, and then it's just how do we work backwards from that valuation, and then build this to that scale. Um, where a uh, big mistake I made early on was I would set small goals for myself, and then I'd reach those goals, and then I'd kind of wander listless for a little bit, and then until I found my next goal. Now I just set a huge, massive goal. I work backwards, chunk it down into lots of little goals, so I make I'm having access actionable things, but that's the most important part as far as I'm concerned is, you know, just have a big goal and a vision. Um, even if you don't necessarily believe you can get there, like if you just keep thinking about it enough, it, it'll come to you. Uh, I mean, I definitely, uh, you know, agree with action obviously being the most important thing, but I'm going to try and not be redundant here. So mm -hmm. what I'm also going to say is pay attention to what you're actually good at and what you're not. And for the things that you aren't, set out there and try and find people that, that are good at those and get to know them and get to know what makes them tick and decide if you can, you know, if you can work with those people. Like I, at my core, I am a tech guy. Um, my business partner, he handles the sales side. And that's mostly because I, it would, we would never have become what we were if I was doing his <laughs> job. 
And he's not someone that would naturally necessarily be in my circles. It's really easy for me to come to these things and just you know sit around in a huddle of programmers talking for a while. <laughs> but that's not what I you know that's not what I need. It's a great you know sounding board for you know for the stuff that I'm you know interested in doing and that I'm already good at. But sometimes it takes a little bit more to stretch out there and to meet the people who can do the things that you're just horrendous at and need help with. And I would say that's, that's the other thing. Uh, getting a good business partner and someone else that is going to be equally invested into that and, and push you when you're not feeling great about it, and, uh, it's very, very important, at least to me. All right, that's it. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>